This module focuses on qualitative methodologies, specifically writing a qualitative methodology section, and also helpful hints for developing qualitative interviews. It was delivered in person on October 7th and has been annotated for students who missed the in-person class opportunity. In this module, you'll be able to do the following. To describe the major methods of qualitative research, to identify some sampling approaches and potential sources of bias, you'll be able to discuss the limitations in qualitative research and potential threats to internal and external validity. And then finally, you'll review the interview protocol and receive feedback from colleagues. So here's our agenda for this particular module. First, we'll review the layout of the method section. We'll discuss which method to choose and why. We'll look at sampling approaches, specifically the who and how of our sample. We'll look at the tools that align to that, the which and the why. And we'll discuss limitations, threats to validity and reliability. Our methodology section will include the context and some information about the research site. It will next include a rationale for use of qualitative methods. And again, this rationale is important because it's not, again, a reiteration of the purpose of the study, but it is a rationale for why qualitative methods make the most sense to answer our research questions. You'll next elaborate on the sample. So who among the population that could be studied is being studied? And specifically, how are you going about selecting them? We'll look to several pages in our patent text that illuminate ways that we can look at sampling. Next, we'll look at your tools. Those are the interview protocols, your observation tools, or your focus group protocol. They will lay out a structure for the questions that you hope to ask, and they will be organized by the research concepts in your conceptual framework. Next, you'll include a timeline for action. So you'll say specifically when you hope to gather this data, uh, you'll lay out a timeline for things that you included in your process, how you developed your project idea, and other important milestones in the development of your study. And then finally, you'll conclude with a section that uh, addresses the limitations of your study. So it says specifically, what were some of the challenges that you would uncover and what are some of the limitations to what you hope to extrapolate from the study? Again, for our doctoral students in this program, as you prepare for defense, you want to be very generative in this section and identify limitations beforehand. This will help you in the task of preparing for your defense. In our choice text, there are really well-written and well-crafted methodology sections. I want to draw your attention to those once again. In Unequal Childhoods, the methodology section is included in Appendix A. In The Dream Keepers, it's also included in Appendix A. And in Choosing Colleges, on pages 14 through 17, you'll find solid, well-written methodology sections, which do each of those things that were mentioned, providing a context about the research site and the research, a rationale for why qualitative methods are the best suited to answer the research question, information about the sample, the tools that were utilized, the timeline for action, and the specific limitations that the author encountered. So next, let's look to the methods section. This slide actually provides a really good comparison between quantitative research methods and qualitative research methods. In quantitative research methods, our primary methods of research are survey, use of statistical data, experiments, and descriptive or secondary data. In qualitative research methods, however, our primary research instruments will be utilized as interviews, focus groups, observations, document analysis, and then open-ended survey items. Here, it's really important to note that uh, a survey itself, which generates closed responses, would be, would be pursued in quantitative research. However, open-ended items, those things that will produce more than a binary yes-no or good-bad response, but that allow 
uh, different participants to elaborate on their experiences would be considered a qualitative instrument. Here's a, a great example. Um, in many of our school districts, we provide teacher professional development, and most of the feedback that we get, we would offer in a kind of quantitative way. We might have a Likert scale to talk about uh, how prepared was my facilitator and rate that from one to seven. But there also may be a space on those kinds of instruments for open-ended responses, like based on today's professional development, here are my next steps. And that would generate very open responses, ones that would make it very difficult for the researcher or the professional development developer to anticipate what the teacher's responses might be. And so here the benefit would be in providing a very open-ended response. So with each of our qualitative research methods in mind, now let's play a bit of a review game. Quiz yourself on a sheet of scratch paper and now number it one to five with each of the following qualitative methods we've just talked about, including open-ended survey items, document analysis, observations, focus groups, and interviews. Listen as I read these scenarios aloud and then determine which research method is the best suited to answer the research question. Example one. The researcher wants to evaluate the extent to which teachers are implementing a new math curriculum with fidelity. Example two, the researcher wants to compare and contrast the perceptions of teachers and assistant teachers about the implementation of project-based learning. Example 3. The researcher wants to review disciplinary referral forms to see which kinds of offenses first-year teachers send students to the principal's office for in order to build a new teacher induction system. Example 4. The researcher wants to gather teacher stories about the experiences and culture of collegial mentorship in high school context. Example 5. In addition to gathering principal demographic information, the researcher wants to know how likely principals are to implement a teacher evaluation system after receiving professional development, what their specific next steps will be, and what supports they need to be effective. Now it's time to check our answers. In example number one, where the researcher wants to look at the fidelity of implementation of a program, the correct answer is observation. In example two, where our researcher wants to compare and contrast two perceptions between teachers and assistant teachers, the best mode is focus groups. These would be much more efficient than interviews to see actually if there is any difference in how teachers and assistant teachers perceive project-based learning. Example three, where the researcher wants to look at differences in how first-year teachers uh, and what offenses they send to the office, the best example would be document analysis. In example four, where the researcher wants to gather teacher stories, the best method is interviews. And finally, in example number five, where the researcher wants to know the extent to which principals will implement uh, a practice, a new teacher evaluation system, the best method would be open-ended surveys. How did you do? Next up, we look at the sample, the who, why, and how. So first, the sample, who and why. When we look for sample, we are asking, who has the information that I need as a researcher? Why will this informant add value to answering my research question? How will I select them? 
in patent, there are a particular approaches. Each of these sampling methods is described on pages 230 to 244 of the third edition. You can also look to exhibit 5.6, which illuminates all of these methods with a short description of each. I want to challenge you to go back to the text and to find which sampling method best describes the method that you have selected. Be sure to use this academic sampling approach in your methodology section. Selection bias is one of the potential limitations that we want to avoid. Often in qualitative research, samples are chosen based on convenience. In order to guard against cherry-picking supportive informants, those that will tell us what we want to hear or things that will confirm our initial hypotheses, we want to consider ways to randomize or purposely select our sample. Again, your patent text names the specific types of sampling approaches that you can select from, each with their own pros and cons. Use this specialized vocabulary in your methodology section. Next, we'll talk about your tools, which tools you're utilizing, and why. At base, the tools that you use should match your methodology. For example, if you are utilizing interviews, you will want to include your interview protocol or the questions that you ask to each of your informant groups. If, for instance, you are utilizing focus groups, similarly, you're going to want to include a focus group protocol which will provide a specific layout of the questions that you're asking, again, organized by the various research concepts in your conceptual framework. Be specific about which kinds of questions you will ask each informant group. Talk about your process of developing the tools or using research-validated instruments. Uh, for those of you who are working on your doctoral research, there are often very good observation tools or interview protocols that you may be able to utilize without reinventing the wheel. But of course, be sure uh, to cite the authors and to seek the other researchers' permission before utilizing their research-validated instruments. But the use of already validated instruments adds additional credibility to your study. How will you ensure the fidelity with the instruments? So for those of you who are doing action research projects located in schools, quite often in your administrative capacity, you're not the only person who observes and provides instructional coaching or support to teachers. If you're utilizing an observation tool to check fidelity, you'll also want in your research methodology, methodology to describe the process in which you build inter-rater reliability, that is, alignment between the various people that will be utilizing an observation tool or instrument. If you're going to be utilizing instructional rounds, you might do so or formalize a process in which you norm on the use of a rubric or the use of an observation tool to ensure consistency between different evaluators. Next, we look at the limitation section of your methodology. In this slide, we look at threats. Some of our key vocabulary are validity, reliability, internal validity, and external validity. By validity, we mean that the study logically and is both logically and factually sound, and that it measures what it says it does. With reliability, we're really looking at consistency. So if you were to do the study again, would you get a consistent result? With internal validity and external validity, I think the graphic here on right sums it up very well for qualitative research. So with internal validity, we're really looking at the process of the methodology to indicate whether the study research is done right, is done correctly. And outside of the study, we're really looking to the extent to which you can generalize or extrapolate findings and results. So to what extent does the research that you've done really, is it able to be generalized beyond just the particular research context? Without good internal validity, it is impossible then to have good external validity. So which is why it's so important for your methodology to be tight. 
Here are some common threats to internal validity in research studies. I want to take a moment to highlight at least two of them uh, that have been at play in some of the research methodologies that I've read so far. One would be compensatory rivalry, otherwise known as resentful demoralization. This is when, in an experimental context, you give uh, the treatment group uh, a particular treatment that the control group is also aware of. So in the case of uh, a school context, you might be sharing uh, a particular uh, instructional strategy with one set of teachers while another set of teachers continues to do their own standard practice. Well, if teachers are aware of this, you could have a case of compensatory rivalry where they decide to uh, really, those teachers that are in the control group decide to boost up their use of strategies or uh, try to become aware of what professional development others in the treatment group are receiving uh, in order to uh, make certain that their data also looks really good. Um, you could see how that would be a concern. On the flip side, teachers might become demoralized and fold their arms, uh, those in the control group, and say, well, if we're not going to get the treatment, then I'm just going to chillax and sit on the side. So you could see how that would be a concern, and you want to address it in the forefront and also consider some strategies in which you would want to guard against this particular limitation. The other is a question of social desirability bias. These are questions or items or bias that comes at play when uh, teachers or others are aware of a preferred answer, and because they know that that answer would be socially desirable, they choose that instead of being completely candid about their own um, reaction. So you want to be careful the extent to which uh, these issues may come up and may be at play in your research, and you want to use the particular names of these threats in that limitation section. With regard to external validity, here are some of, of the four most common threats to external validity. You'll find more information about them in your patent text, but they're a little less acute given the focus on qualitative research than on quantitative research. And now it's time to pause and ponder. Let's take some time to reread the limitations section of your methodology that you submitted on Monday. Based on the threats to validity that we just reviewed, identify at least two additional potential limitations to the internal or external validity in your study. Where possible, how will you overcome these obstacles? In our next section, I share with you some advice about asking great questions for your qualitative interviews. And so qualitative interviews really should focus on the art of asking good questions, questions that will elicit narratives and stories. From Rubin and Rubin, a book on qualitative interviewing, they suggest that qualitative interviewing requires intensive listening, a respect for and curiosity about people's experiences and perspectives, and the ability to ask about what is not yet understood. Given that we're in the midst of an election season, I thought our next example should come from a political pollster talking about the impact of qualitative research in our political understanding. Peter Hart is a well-regarded and renowned pollster, uh, and this excerpt, this clip, is actually taken from The Axe Files, which is a weekly podcast hosted by uh, David Axelrod. I want you to listen to this three-minute clip for areas uh, of agreement or uh, reinforcement of our shared understandings of qualitative research. Peter Hart, in this clip, focuses on focus groups, his use of focus groups, to get at deeper understandings behind our political candidates for president. You can access this excerpted clip on our Blackboard. A few qualitative interviewing tips. In an interview, you're essentially having a conversation, so you want to build a relationship. This is what you are attempting to do in your icebreaker question. Second, go deep and detailed versus get to the point already focus of most of our conversations. How often are we engaging in casual conversation and really not being honest or very detailed with our stories? So in a qualitative interview, as opposed to a normal conversation, 
we really want to focus on going deep and getting at the details. We also want to avoid extraneous questions. We want to focus on an alignment to our research question. We want to listen and respond, and that's one of really the values of the semi-structured format that we followed for our interview protocols. Use that as a guide and not a script. So if uh, a research respondent gives you something interesting that you want to follow up on, feel free to follow up. You don't want to be a robot. You want to have a great conversation. You want to both listen and respond appropriately and ask follow-up questions that get to those nuanced understandings that will build your findings. Next, you want to elicit narratives and stories that will illuminate those new findings I talked about. And where appropriate, consider novelty in your questioning to get a more enlightening response, just as Peter Hart has done in the excerpted example. In our face-to-face meeting in class, we utilized the triad protocol to offer our colleagues feedback on the interview protocols. If you are watching this as an annotated lecture, you might consider doing this with a family member or classmate. Thanks for your participation in this module. As always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out or to set up a conference.